It happened every year for about 300 years. Migratory fishers left their homes in Europe to catch cod on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. But dramatic change came to the industry at the end of the 1700s, when two decades of war disrupted the migratory fishery. By the time peace was restored in 1815, the industry had been replaced by a quickly growing resident fishery. This video takes a look at the transition from a migratory to a resident fishery. It also compares and contrasts the two industries. The earliest recorded shipment in the migratory fishery dates back to 1502. A merchant from Bristol, England named Hugh Elliot sent a vessel to Newfoundland. It returned a few months later with 36 tons of fish. Elliot made a tidy profit and invested again and again in the new industry. He wasn't alone. Soon, hundreds of ships and thousands of men crossed the Atlantic every year to catch and process cod. It was a multinational enterprise. Portuguese, Spanish, and Basque fishers all took part, but France and England truly dominated the industry. As far as the Western Europeans were concerned, the cod stocks were theirs for the taking. Few, if any, questioned the rights that the people already living in the lands we today know as Newfoundland and Labrador had to the fishing grounds. In the beginning, the French presence was by far the strongest. That changed after 1713, when the Treaty of Utrecht granted Britain control over Newfoundland. France still had seasonal fishing rights to part of the coast, but its involvement steadily declined. The migratory fishery would soon become an overwhelmingly English enterprise. Although the various countries carried out the fishery in slightly different ways, we can still provide a broad description of the migratory fishery at Newfoundland and Labrador. There were two main branches, an inshore fishery based on land and an offshore fishery based at the Grand Banks. Inshore fishers arrived at Newfoundland and Labrador aboard large ocean-going ships. They usually left southwestern European ports in March or April, spent about five weeks crossing the ocean, and made landfall in May. Once there, the large ships remained largely unused for the rest of the fishing season. The crews spent the first few weeks building or repairing the infrastructure of the fishery. That included cabins, cookhouses, sheds, stages, and the flakes large wooden platforms where the fish would be spread out to dry in the sun. The fishing season began in June. Early each morning, the men left for the fishing grounds. They used boats that were much smaller than the ships that had carried them across the ocean. The most common design was the shallop. It was about 10 meters long, could be rowed or sailed, and, importantly, could hold an entire day's catch of cod. That could number about a thousand fish. The gear that the fishers used was simple. Iron hooks and weights attached to long hand lines. A fisher baited his hook, dropped it in the water, and pulled the line up and down until he caught a fish. When their boats were full, the men returned to shore. Long forks were used to hoist the fish from the boat onto the wooden stages. Now it was time for the shore workers to process the catch. The headers removed the fish's guts and heads, the splitters removed the backbone, and the salters stacked the fish between layers of salt. There the cod rested for a few days before being washed in water and spread out to dry in the sun and the air. Most fish was spread out on flakes, but other surfaces also worked, like cobbles on a beach. The shore crew turned the cod once a day and piled it up at night. Ships involved in the offshore banks fishery did not land at Newfoundland and Labrador. They sailed directly from Europe to the Grand Banks, 
the men spent the entire fishing season living and working aboard the same ships that brought them across the ocean. They were called bankers. This illustration of a banker was published in the year 1772. A close look can give us a sense of how the fishery operated. The men standing along the side of the vessel are fishing. Like the inshore fishers, they also used baited hooks and weights attached to long hand lines. When they hauled a fish on board, a junior crew member brought it to the header who removed the fish's head and guts. The splitter then removed the bones and the rest was dropped into the ship's hold where it was packed in layers of salt. Unlike the inshore fishery, the cod was not spread out to dry. Instead, it remained in the hold until the ship returned to Europe. The offshore fish was much more heavily salted than the sun-dried fish of the inshore fishery. The different preservation techniques gave each branch of the fishery a different name. The inshore fishery was known as the dry fishery, while the banks fishery was known as a wet fishery or a green fishery. The migratory fishery lasted for about three centuries before it finally gave way to a resident operation in the early 1800s. What sparked this change? The short answer is two decades of war. From 1792 to 1815, the French Revolutionary, Anglo-American, and Napoleonic Wars created a set of circumstances that led to the collapse of the migratory fishery and the rapid influx of English and Irish settlers to Newfoundland and Labrador. Most settled on the island. Although the island's year-round population had slowly increased during the 17th and 18th centuries, and a resident fishery had developed during that time, it did not come close to rivaling the migratory fisheries until Europe entered a prolonged period of war at the end of the 1700s. During the wars, Britain dramatically reduced its fishing fleet for two main reasons. To protect the fleet from enemy attack while crossing the Atlantic, and to recruit experienced seamen from the migratory fishery into the Royal Navy. The number of British ships engaged in the transatlantic fishery dropped from about 300 in 1792 to less than 50 in 1817. At the same time, Newfoundland and Labrador's permanent population steadily increased during the wars. English and Irish immigrants arrived to avoid enlistment into the military and to work in the quickly growing resident fishery. It was a profitable enterprise. The resident fishery offered good work and lots of it. As the battling nations withdrew from the fishery, Newfoundland and Labrador acquired an almost complete monopoly over the salt fish trade. Conditions were perfect for the resident fishery to expand and eclipse the migratory fishery. This was also helped along by the growth of a new industry. The spring seal hunt gave fishers work in the off-season and made permanent year-round settlement much more economically feasible. The migratory fishery had been a large-scale operation. It was financed by European merchants who sent shiploads of men overseas every year to catch cod. The resident fishery was different. It relied on local fishing crews and on local merchants. There were three branches, an inshore fishery, a Labrador fishery, and an offshore fishery on the Grand Banks. Family labor underpinned the inshore fishery. The men and older boys caught the cod in small open boats, while the women, children, and older male relatives became the shore crew. They did the work of the headers, splitters, and salters, and they were the ones who spread the fish on flakes to dry in the air and the sun. Otherwise, the nature of the inshore fishery remained largely unchanged. Fishers left their coastal homes early each morning to row or sail to nearby fishing grounds and returned when their boats were filled with cod. The shore crew split, salted, and dried the fish. Merchant firms still acquired much of the catch, 
but they were mostly based in Newfoundland and Labrador instead of Europe. In the spring, merchants gave the fishing families gear, food, and other supplies on credit, then the fishers paid them back with cod in the fall. This economic arrangement was called the truck system. After 1815, some of Newfoundland's inshore cod stocks were becoming depleted. Some fishers who lived on the island's northeast coast decided to travel to Labrador aboard schooners and other sailing vessels to catch fish there. The Labrador fishery was divided into two groups, stationers and floaters. Stationers were fishing families who simply moved their work from Newfoundland to Labrador for the summer. They set up camp on land and rowed to the fishing grounds each day in small, open boats. The fish was brought back to shore and processed on land. The families returned to their homes on the island at the end of the season. Floaters were different. They lived on their schooners during the fishing season and sailed up and down the Labrador coast in search of cod. They packed their fish in salt and brought it back to Newfoundland at the end of each season to be dried there. The floater fishery didn't rely on family labor. Instead, it used hired crews of men and women. In the 1860s, even the Labrador stocks were becoming depleted, so a third branch of the fishery grew in importance. An offshore fishery on the Grand Banks. Fishers traveled to the Grand Banks aboard wooden schooners, sealing steamers, and other ocean-going vessels. They anchored the ships in a good location and then launched small open boats into the water. Fishers rowed to the various fishing grounds and returned to the larger ships several times each day to unload their catch. The crews processed the catch at sea and remained on the banks for weeks at a time. Unlike the inshore and Labrador fisheries, women and children did not participate in this industry. The salt cod fisheries were the economic backbone of the Newfoundland and Labrador economy throughout the 1800s. Still, most fishing families had to do other work to support themselves year-round. This might include hunting in the fall, woodcutting in the winter, hunting seals in the spring, and growing vegetables in the summer. <laughs>